welcome to this Ask a Radiation Oncologist session with a focus on treatments for breast cancer. My name is Dr. Kiri Cook from Oregon Health and Science University, and I'll be moderating the discussion. Throughout this session, we will answer questions you may have about breast cancers. The panelists and I will be covering an assortment of topics, including treatment options, how radiation therapy can be used, possible side effects, and more. We have a distinguished panel who will share their expertise with us. Joining me is Dr. Roberto Diaz from Moffitt Cancer Center in Florida, Dr. Damilola Oladeru from University of Florida, and Dr. Jean Wright from Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC. Next slide. The agenda for this Ask a Radiation Oncologist session will be a review of what breast cancer is, uh, we'll discuss the range of treatment options, then we'll talk through common questions patients may have. We will then share the American Society for Radiation Oncology's recommendations about the COVID-19 vaccine for patients with cancer, and then show you our patient education materials and website, RT Answers, where you can learn more. Next slide. Finally, this discussion is informational only and should not be used in place of advice specific to your condition from your medical professional. We will discuss treatments including surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and others. We encourage you to talk to other specialists about any treatments you are considering. So without further ado, let's begin the session. Uh, so the types of cancers we'll discuss are invasive cancer or in uh, pre-invasive breast cancer, such as DCIS. Um, so first question, um, Dr. Oladeru, can you just go over briefly what is breast cancer? Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, so breast cancer is um, defined as a malignant um, growth. Um, specifically in the breast. Um, this is something that can happen in both female and male individuals. Um, and it arises from either ducts or, um, um, or lobules um, of the breast. So we have different ways in which we can describe breast cancers. Some are described as invasive ductal carcinoma, meaning it's an abnormal um, replication of cells arising from the ducts or invasive lobular cancer, uh, carcinoma. Um, these are abnormal, abnormally dividing cells that arise from lobules of the breast. We also have other categories of pre-invasive um, growths of the breast, um, such as ductal carcinoma in situ um, and lobular carcinoma in situ as well. Thank you. Um, moving to the next slide, what, uh, Dr. Diaz, what are some common symptoms of this cancer and how is breast cancer diagnosed? Sure. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity to uh, discuss. As the slide is showing, there are different um, symptoms and signs that a patient can, can look in for. For example, one of the most common ones is a lump in the breast. Um, now that can be benign or it could be something that needs to be further worked up. It could be uh, pulled in nipple or retraction of the nipple or dimpling. Also some dripping or discharge from your nipple, a redness or a rash, especially if it's fast growing. And as well, some skin changes are some of the signs and symptoms of breast cancer. But I also need to clarify that many times early stage breast cancer or breast cancer that is early in its presentation is not detected by any signs or symptoms. And that is why most breast cancers in the United States are diagnosed by screening mammograms um, as one of the ways. Thank you. Um, next slide. Uh, Dr. Wright, what happens after someone is diagnosed with breast cancer? Sure. So uh, as we can see from the slide that we're looking at, there are a wide range of treatment options for breast cancer. And the appropriate sequencing and combination of these treatments is really highly variable from case to case. So we wouldn't say that there is a standard um, you know, management strategy for, uh, for breast cancer as a whole. 
I would say that most breast cancers, um, when they are uh, found in an early stage, are managed with surgery at some point. And then these other strategies, such as chemo, hormone therapy, and targeted therapy, which are systemic therapies, uh, and radiation therapy, which is something that is considered adjuvant or um, directed at the surgical area, um, the sequencing and timing uh, of those is going to be really variable from patient to patient. Okay. Um. Can I just make a comment about the previous slide? And that is that a woman should know that not all women, uh, the treatment for breast cancer, surgically speaking, is a mastectomy. Yes, sometimes that is required, um, but many a times um, a surgeon, and this is a discussion between the patient and her surgeon, they may elect a surgical approach such as a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy. And almost always that should be followed with radiation therapy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Oladeru, is there a way to prevent this cancer or catch it earlier? And do you have any comments about diet or supplements? That's a very um, common question patients ask. Um, we recommend that all women um, follow the American Cancer Society guidelines for early detection screening, especially if you have an average risk of breast cancer. So I'd say first thing would be, it's important to know your family history. Um, does there appear to be a trend among the women or men in your family um, in terms of having breast cancer? And inform your primary care physician about such trends that you may observe. So you can come up with a plan in case you fall into a category of women or men who need to have um, earlier screenings. Otherwise, annual mammograms are highly recommended for women. Um, and we say it's optional beginning at age 40, but annual mammogram should begin according to ACS guidelines between age 45 to 54, then every two years for 55 and older, unless you choose to stick with yearly screenings. In some women, we prefer MRIs in lieu of mammograms, especially if they have very dense breasts, which may make it hard to detect um, these lesions on a mammogram. Um, other ways in terms of um, catching it earlier, we, you know your, your body best. So we encourage self breast exams. Um, you can ask your primary care provider to show you how he or she does it during your visit. So you can check yourself you know, while you're in the shower or while you're getting dressed. If you notice anything, you're also, you're the most likely person to catch it first uh, before you see your physician. In terms of diet and um, supplements, we don't recommend um, anything specific to pre prevent breast cancer, but for everyone, regardless of your risk, we say try and you know, maintain a healthy diet, no matter how old you are, what stage of life you're in, and what your um, comorbidities are. We recommend a healthy diet for everyone. Um, and in terms of supplements, we generally um, tell women to avoid estrogen related supplements because we know that breast cancer cells feed on this. Some breast cancer cells can't feed on estrogen. And so um, that's a general and broad recommendation that could be controversial, not a hard, fast rule. But there's nothing specifically in terms of a diet that you can create and follow to help you avoid breast cancer. Okay, so let's get into some of the treatment for breast cancer. Um, Dr. Diaz, um, which doctors are typically involved um, when treating breast cancer and what types of treatments are offered by each physician? Um, as Dr. Wright already um, mentioned, almost always a surgeon, a breast surgeon is involved um, usually in the beginning and the types of surgeries that could be offered vary as well. They could offer the patient, as I mentioned earlier, partial mastectomy or lumpectomy, or they could offer them a mastectomy or complete removal of the breast. There is also assessment of the lymph nodes. Um, if there is invasive breast cancer in most patients, 
and the surgeon would determine if there's a sentinel lymph node biopsy that is required. And some cases may actually um, need a lymph node dissection. And that is a decision between um, the patient and her surgeon. And that is the top uh, figure that you see in the left, on, on, on the left. Um, if there is a lumpectomy or in some even cases of mastectomy, usually when lymph, lymph nodes are involved, then radiation therapy is also um, a, a treatment for the patients. And we will go into more specifics about what is radiation therapy in subsequent slides um, and the timing of the radiation. And as also, as was alluded um, earlier, there is also the role of a medical oncologist. And the medical oncologist is the one that um, prescribes systemic therapy options. Some patients may require chemotherapy. Some patients may require hormonal therapy, and some patients may require targeted therapies. And it all depends on how advanced your cancer is, that is called staging. And that also depends on the subtype of breast cancer because different breast cancers could have different subtypes. And that is another lengthy discussion that a patient must have with his or her um, physician. And depending on the subtype of breast cancer and how advanced it is, that those are the things that a medical oncologist would think about what would be the best systemic therapy to deliver or recommend uh, to his or her patient. I'll interject and add that in addition to the doctors that are going to be um, making treatment recommendations and performing treatments that Dr. Diaz just reviewed, there are a lot of other specialists who are often involved in the diagnosis and um, making treatment decisions for patients. And I'll just highlight radiology, um, since we know that most breast cancers in the US are going to be diagnosed after a screening mammogram uh, or some form of imaging. Uh, very often a radiologist may be the first doctor that a patient interacts with. Um, once a biopsy is done or when surgery is done, then a pathologist would be the person who would review um, the microscopic diagnosis and uh, determine things like the subtype uh, that Dr. Diaz just referred to. Um, also, uh, there are physicians who specialize in assessing genetic risk and um, lots of other sort of um, ancillary um, services that patients may need, physical therapy, um, things like that as well. I guess I'll just add that at many centers, um, all of these doctors work together and review <clears throat> cases um, in a multidisciplinary fashion um, at what's called a tumor board or a meeting where each patient's case is um, discussed individually with all the specialists. Um, so let's move to the next slide. Um, Dr. Wright, um, if you could talk about um, how do doctors know which treatment is best for an individual patient, patient and um, which treatment comes first? Sure. So um, as we've, I think, highlighted already, really what is right for an individual patient is going to be really variable. I'd say that the key things that are going to be considered in determining what treatment is necessary and what should come first um, would be the specifics of the breast cancer diagnosis and the subtype. Um, when we look at the subtype for breast cancer, we focus on whether or not the breast cancer cells express receptors for estrogen, uh, because that's an important variable in terms of determining whether a patient would have hormone therapy. There are other markers such as the HER2 marker that would influence whether a patient needed specific types of targeted therapy. Um, and so the subtype, which you may be familiar with terms like HER2 positive or triple negative um, would be very important. Another really important aspect is the stage. And so depending on the scenario, uh, breast imaging would be uh, utilized to help assess the extent of the disease in the breast. And in some cases, uh, imaging of the other parts of the body may be recommended. Putting all of this together then, um, the doctor or the team of doctors really would come up with the best strategy. I'd say for many patients, surgery is the first treatment, although there are certain stages of disease and certain um, subtypes of breast cancer where the first treatment would be some form of systemic therapy. Um, Dr. Oladeru, could you answer this one? Does everyone get surgery, radiation, and systemic therapy? 
Thank you, Dr. Cook. No, not everyone um, gets all these three uh, treatment modalities. Some patients um, might only have surgery and not need radiation, but still require some type of hormonal therapy. Um, there are also patients who will require surgery, radiation, followed by some type of hormonal therapy. Oftentimes, and usually if you've had chemotherapy first, you're technically higher risk. So you would probably also have surgery. Um, and in some not so common instances, you may be able to omit radiation um, if you've had new adjuvant chemo, um, but most, most times you will be having um, radiation treatment. Um, and this would be followed by hormonal therapy. So it really varies from patient to patient. Um, all treatment plans are tailored to the stage, um, to the patient. Um, and um, also it's usually a joint decision between all three specialties um, at tumor board. Um, Dr. Diaz, could you talk a little bit about radiation therapy specifically? What is it, how does it work and how often is it given? Sure, um, thanks. Uh, so radiation therapy is using high energy x-rays. Um, think about an x-ray, but at least a thousand times more powerful that is used to actually treat um, a, in this case, breast cancer. Um, the way it works as the uh, slide points on the bottom left is it actually works by um, breaking the DNA strand. And it usually is on, on cells that like to replicate fast. And cancer is one of those cells that like to duplicate fast. So the, one of the ways that radiation works is by causing these single strand and double strand breaks in the DNA, thereby the cell uh, would die. Um, again, we, we all trained to go into a lot more specifics into, into the, the mechanism of, of, um, uh, radicals, uh, oxygen radicals, and uh, which is the mechanism, one of the mechanisms of actions. But um, that is something that if you're curious, you can talk to your doctor about. But anyways, what is more um, interest, something that interests my patients more is, is to know how often is radiation therapy given? And that is a really good um, um, question, because it varies. Um, traditionally, it used to be for breast cancer from 25 to 30 treatments. And that is also the case. But with new advances in our field, we have been able to um, deliver the radiation treatment as quickly as in three weeks, even four weeks. Um, and that is daily treatment. There's also newer studies that have come out recently that in select patients, not everybody, you can actually deliver the radiation treatment in five uh, fractions. So that is a good question to ask your physician, your radiation oncologist, what is the best um, treatment for their breast cancer? Is this something that it can be done in five treatments? Um, does it have to be the entire breast or just part of the breast? Um, or is it something that it needs to be done in 15 to 20 um, treatments? Or some cases you do still require 25 to 30 um, treatments. Um, there's also select Treatments for breast cancer can also be done in uh, various ways to the part of the breast. Um, they can use um, a device that is implanted inside the breast for, we call that partial breast irradiation using um, brachytherapy. In the United States, we use intracavitary. And again, it's not every center can use that, um, but it's a way that it, they're able to deliver high dose of radiation in um, five days for select patients, not everybody. And there's also some centers that are able to deliver the radiation at the time of surgery. And, but again, it, it, this is not offered to everybody. It is a discussion between you, your surgeon and your radiation oncologist as to what is the, specifically when it deals with how often radiation is given and the type of radiation that is offered is a discussion between the patient and his or her radiation doctor. And I would welcome comments from my colleagues on this as well. Um, I would add, I think we've focused a lot of our discussion on the role of radiation in what we call early stage breast cancer. 
And in that scenario, um, you know, typically the radiation therapy is delivered after surgery. We've talked about different scenarios where the um, sequencing of systemic therapies can be varied. But as a general rule, the radiation would come at some point after the surgery um, for patients with early stage disease. Um, there is another role for radiation therapy in patients who have had the disease spread to other parts of the body where the cancer deposits could be causing problems, such as pain, for example, um, if, the bone, if the bone is affected with the cancer. And in that scenario, uh, the radiation therapy could be delivered um, you know, outside of the context of surgery to a particular part of the body where, uh, where the tumor is causing problems. And those are, in general, shorter courses of radiation therapy that might range from something like one session in certain scenarios up to about uh, 10 sessions. Uh, so that's another important role for radiation therapy for when patients have um, symptoms or problems that are directly related to their cancer. Okay, thank you. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Oladeiru, um, does well, I, we sort of touched on this. Um, sounds like many people don't, some people don't actually need radiation. Um, what does that mean if someone's doctor says I have the option to skip radiation? Yes, yeah, so we are seeing that more commonly now, um, and we believe it's a patient physician. Um, uh, you know, discussion um, that usually comes up and leads to this decision. And the reason why it's an option now is because there have been studies involving um, patients with specific types of cancers. So these are patients who have very early stage breast cancer, meaning a stage whereby it's most likely going to be curable anyway, um, and that they're going to do well. And also specifically um, patients who are of a certain age. So one of the first studies that um, suggested that we could omit radiation was done in patients um, who are above the age of 70. Um, and there are now studies looking at it from even the age of 65 and even some ongoing looking at it from the age of 50. But for now, we'll say from the age of 70. And usually these are women who um, they've had an excellent surgery the tumor removed was very small. There was no lymph nodes involved. The grade was quite low. Um, and there was no evidence that there was anything in the surrounding environment of where the cancer was removed that would make them at a high risk of it coming back. So these are patients they followed for a long time and saw that the risk of the cancer coming back within the breast is quite low. And it's low enough for us to consider foregoing radiation therapy. Now, there are patients, however, who will tell me and my colleagues in clinic that, well, even if it's a 1% risk of coming back in 10 years or 2% or 10% risk, I'd rather a 0% risk um, and I still want radiation treatment. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an option. Um, we don't enforce it on patients, but we want them to know it's an option, just weighing the risk versus the benefit of radiation in terms of um, local recurrence um, and in local recurrence within the breast um, of the cancer coming back. Yeah, I um, also add to that that I tell my patients who are over 70 that if they're going to skip radiation, our pact is that they must uh, agree to take the uh, um, endocrine therapy that their medical oncologist is recommending because um, the study that was just cited, it was in patients who had a lumpectomy followed by um, taking endocrine therapy for five years. Um, the other group that can also, um, we could say could skip radiation is in those patients with um, stage zero or non-invasive breast cancer, DCIS, that is low grade and small. And those, you don't have to be over 70 for us to have the discussion that, as um, was uh, already um, said, that if they had a great surgery uh, with very adequate margins and it's a small non-invasive um, breast cancer, even in younger women, I'm talking somebody in her 60s, late 50s, uh, that has non-invasive breast cancer, that is also a consideration between the physician and his or her um, um, sorry, between the patient and his or her physician um, to skip radiation. Okay. 
Okay. Let's move to the next slide. Um, Dr. Oladeiru, um, why do some patients get chemotherapy first? And um, if they, if one does do that and they find that all the cancer is gone after the chemotherapy, um, why does someone still need surgery and possibly radiation? Um, so first, it's important to highlight what chemotherapy is doing. So this is a drug that's anti-cancer that's working throughout your body. And so they're usually in patients whereby we have reasons to believe we need to get ahead of the cancer spreading um, before it gets out of hand. So there are multiple reasons. One, giving chemotherapy can afford us the opportunity to actually shrink a tumor down to a size that allows the surgeon to remove the cancer completely. And patients could even have the option of a breast conserving surgery, like a lumpectomy instead of a mastectomy. So rather than removing the entire breast, it could shrink the tumor down to remove only the cancer. Also in patients who present with um, can evidence of cancer in their lymph nodes, those patients, we want to de decrease the extent of disease in the lymph nodes and allow for a less invasive lymph node surgery, one, and two, decrease the chances of this cancer spreading. Because if it's already spread regionally to the lymph nodes, there could be microscopic cancer cells that have you know, traveled elsewhere that we just can't see yet on imaging. And chemotherapy helps us get ahead of that. And neoadjuvant therapy, which is what it's called when you get chemotherapy first, is often used in inflammatory breast cancer. It's used in um, HER2, so that's a particular um, marker that's going to be tested for at your biopsy. So if you're HER2 positive breast cancer, often we would use neoadjuvant therapy. In triple negative breast cancers, um, maybe not the super small ones, but certainly the stage two, stage three will require neoadjuvant therapy. High grade, meaning grade three, super aggressive, large breast cancers, cancers that have spread to the lymph nodes. So those are the patients who we will always um, often just recommend some form of chemotherapy regimen upfront. And um... If someone is told that, you know, say they got repeat breast imaging and they said that there's no evidence of cancer left, um, is it important to still have the surgery and radiation? It's still important to have the surgery um, because we need to confirm pathologically that everything is actually gone, meaning that the chemotherapy took care of all the cancer um, and that there's nothing left, which we call residual disease, whether it's residual disease in the breast or residual disease in the nodes. So the type of surgery you'd be a candidate for is up to discussion and it's based on um, your anatomy, the mass, what it was before and after, and also discussion with your surgeon, whether you have a mastectomy or breast conserving surgery. Now, if you have breast conserving surgery, you will require radiation treatment um, because we need to make sure that we are targeting any microscopic cancer cells that might still be left behind within the breast and around the cavity after a lumpectomy. Now, there are cases of patients who may have a complete response, meaning nothing in the breast, nothing in the nodes, and they had very small disease where we might discuss the option of omitting radiation therapy in those patients. But generally speaking, if one has had a mastectomy for, you know, after neoadjuvant treatment, you're most likely heading down the line of post-mastectomy radiation. And what we'd be radiating in that setting, even though the breast tissue has been removed, would be the chest wall. And depending on the state of the lymph nodes, um, before and after treatment, um, you, would, you might require also lymph node radiation as well. Um, so it's, more often that we see patients who are getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy who end up getting all these three modalities, meaning surgery and some form of radiation treatment. Thank you. Let's move on. We have some um, commonly asked questions um, by patients. 
So um, Dr. Diaz, um, how do we know that treatment is working and what do we do for follow-up or to check on um, a patient's status um, moving forward? And um, if there is a recurrence or spread of disease, can radiation be given more than once? So very good questions. Um, so in the context of follow-up, what I tell my patients is unfortunately, is time will tell. Um, as long as the patient has done everything that was recommended, now we need to follow her closely with, um, in some institutions, they do clinical breast exams uh, by their physicians every six months, um, but it must be done at least yearly and also follow the recommendations from their surgeon or radiologist as to what is the best um, imaging modality. As was alluded earlier, some patients may require uh, MRIs. If a patient has had a um, breast conserving surgery, they will still receive at least annual mammographies. In some instances, they may even require it every six months. It, it, is, it can be variable, but the mammography will be at least every six months. It, I'm sorry, every year. Um, in terms of uh, other scans, that is the decision with the medical oncologist as to if the patient would require a CAT scan or a PET scan, um, that is a discussion with your medical oncologist um, because in some instances, they may be monitoring the highest of high-risk patients. Um, some institutions check for tumor markers. Many institutions do not because they can be uh, variable when it comes specifically to breast cancer. Um, with regards to your other question about can radiation be given more than once, um, I'm, I am assuming that this is in the same area. We tend to say no. However, there are instances in which we do re-irradiate um, a breast or a chest wall. It also has to do with how many years has it been or the time interval between the previous radiation, the longer, the safer for us to re-irradiate. And there have also been recent studies that even after a patient having received a lumpectomy and whole breast radiation, that if they have another lumpectomy, we can do um, radiation treatment to just that part of the breast where the tumor came back if it was just a small tumor that came back. So it is a very personalized decision. Not everybody would be recommended to be re-irradiated, but it can be done um, as I mentioned, time interval and location of the recurrence. And, uh, and I may also make a comment that if the, for example, if somebody had a right-sided breast cancer and then a few years later, it comes now with a left-sided breast cancer, that is a completely different scenario. Yes, we can give radiation to a, the same patient because it is a completely different site. So that is not a problem. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Uh, Dr. Wright, um, we touched on this a little bit, but what treatment options are available if the cancer does come back um, or spreads to other organs? So it's definitely going to be um, kind of different uh, approaches depending on if it returns in the same area where it started or in the lymph nodes of that same area, which we call a local or a regional recurrence, versus if it comes back in a different um, area of the body. So I think Dr. Diaz just did a good job of talking about handling a scenario where it comes back in the same breast or in the same area. Um, we would have to evaluate what surgery had been done previously and what treatment had been done previously. If it's possible, um, many of these patients with um, you know, with cancer coming back in the local or the regional area can still undergo a therapy that has a curative goal. And it may involve more chemotherapy or systemic therapy, more surgery. And, you know, depending on the scenario, possibly consideration of either more radiation or if the patient didn't have radiation the first time to do radiation at that point. Uh, so it would be, um, you know, kind of tailored on a case by case basis, but the approach, as long as the disease hadn't spread to another uh, body part, would be to, you know, uh, once again, um, uh, offer a treatment that had a curative goal. If the cancer comes back in other places in the body, 
then we do think a little bit differently about that because we think at that point that the disease is more of a systemic process. It means that there are cancer cells that um, have you know, traveled throughout the body to go to different areas. And so most of the time in that situation, we view systemic treatments as kind of the backbone of the care, whether that's hormone-based treatments or chemotherapy or targeted therapies for, for certain types, uh, subtypes of the breast cancer. Um, but that comes back to what I mentioned earlier, the situation where if it is spreading to another organ, uh, bone is a common organ that uh, breast cancer in particular can spread to. And when it travels to the bone, it can cause uh, pain as one of the common symptoms. And so another role for radiation is actually to try to alleviate pain with radiation in that scenario. I would yeah. only add that it's also a discussion with the medical oncologist if it has spread to other organs, because um, as Dr. Wright uh, alluded to, it is a systemic um, disease at that point, and they may have um, other treatment regimens that could be um, available for the patient. They may switch around the systemic therapy that a patient uh, may need. Okay, next slide. Um, Dr. Oladeru, could you talk a little bit about the side effects um, that can be expected from radiation therapy, um, what things are done to minimize the side effects, and then um, in the long term, what side effects are associated with treatment? So this is the most commonly asked question and probably the most fearful from all patients. Um, I've been gone to Dr. Google first before the consultation. Um, but truly, we want you to know that we would not be recommending something that we feel could be significantly harmful to you. So radiation therapy requires a certain extent of exper expertise. And so we're very careful in making sure that the dose we're prescribing and where it's going, it's going ex essentially to where we intend it to. The side effects we expect from all patients um, that's in the short term, meaning while you're going through treatment, in about one to two weeks after you finish treatment that you'll observe is fatigue. It's, this is perhaps the only systemic thing you'll feel um, when it comes to radiation. And this is not a kind of like chemotherapy fatigue. It's more of a generalized fatigue. It's not going to keep you in bed. Um, you'll still be able to remain act, you know, active as you would normally, um, but you might feel like taking a nap or two. Um, and these side effects are gradual. So we're giving small doses daily that accumulate throughout your treatment. And as it, you continue through treatment, you'll start to notice these, these short-term side effects more. The second is skin irritation. So the target itself, the breast, and if we're treating the lymph nodes, you'll notice some redness. You may observe in some patients, not all patients, but some patients may have peeling and that could be due to intentional dosing of the skin of the chest wall. So not all patients are going to actually observe peeling or skin breakdown. But generally speaking, you will observe some redness or some color changes on the skin of the breast. And this will improve over time and gradually go back to the contralateral side, to what the contralateral side looks like. Some patients report mouth itching, which we can prescribe um, creams for. Some patients might report tenderness or feeling um, you know, some type of uh, twinge or pain or shooting pain in the breast itself. Um, and these are not types of pains that would require uh, narcotics in any way. Usually with over-the-counter medication, um, it, they find relief, but those are possible short-term side effects that are likely. The very less likely things we would see during treatment are muscle tightening, Arm swelling during treatment would be very less likely. A sore throat from radiation during treatment for breast cancer is also very less likely. Shortness of breath or coughing while you're undergoing treatment is extremely less likely. In the long term, um, we do tell patients that they might observe some mild um, darkening of the skin, such as hyperpigment hyperpigmentation. Um, your skin and your breast will still feel soft if you've had a lumpectomy, um, but you might notice some scar tissue formation at the site of where we may have given you a boost to the cavity. In the long term, patients who especially have had a lymph node, extensive lymph node dissection, 
those patients, if they have radiation on top of that, might also report some arm swelling. We do recommend things like physical therapy for women um, so they can begin um, to manage what may be signs or symptoms of arm swelling or lymphedema during treatment. In the long term, some patients report that the radiated breast might appear perkier, um, sort of like you've had a mild lift compared to the untreated size, not a sizable difference, like a significant cup size change, but your breast size might appear as though it has changed a bit. Um, the long-term side effects of radiation treatment that we tell patients about, especially during the consent process, these are very uh, things that we don't see commonly in our career. In fact, we will probably see very few of it in our individual careers, but it can happen, so we have to mention it. Um, but they're very, very uncommon. One would be heart problems. Um, and second would be a rib fracture. Third would be shortness of breath or a cough or a dry cough. Usually the shortness of breath and dry cough, if it does occur, though rare, it can be treated with steroids. Um, and then for all patients, no matter what we treat, what dose we're giving, where we're treating, whether it's the finger or the breast, we tell all patients there is a risk of a second cancer. Um, there are things that can be done to minimize these side effects. In general, with fatigue, we tell patients to try and rest as much as possible during treatment, but also keep active as much as they can. Secondly, there are creams that you know many survivors would recommend to you, but individual clinics will also have their preferences for things that they would recommend for you to apply to the breast during the course of treatment to help aid that healing process or minimize the skin irritation or redness. And then as I've mentioned, physical therapy for the arm swelling, if we feel you're at a high risk of it, we will recommend that as something you begin earlier, um, including wearing things like a sleeve to minimize um, the likelihood of it happening or to minimize the morbidity from it if it does happen. I would like to just only add, if I can, that um, when the patient is undergoing treatment, we, they, they see the radiation oncologist at least once a week to assess for these side effects and then make early interventions and also emphasize the importance of adequate follow-up for the patients after treatment for the reasons that um, were so eloquently explained. Okay, um, so let's talk briefly about uh, COVID-19. Um, you may have questions related to the COVID-19 vaccines and how they might factor into your cancer treatment. ASTRO, or the American Society for Radiation Oncology, issued a recommendation on COVID-19 vaccination for cancer patients receiving radiation therapy. The full statement is on these two slides, but our main message is that cancer patients may have an increased risk of contracting COVID-19 and more severe disease if infected. ASTRO encourages cancer patients who are actively receiving treatments such as radiation therapy to consult with their oncologists about the timing for vaccination injection location, and any unique considerations relevant for their treatments. Next slide. Um, be sure to visit rtanswers.org, our patient education website, for more information on radiation therapy and breast cancers. On it, you will also find a full array of information, including brochures and videos on a variety of cancers that you can view online, more information about radiation therapy, and questions you should ask your doctor. We also have patient stories where cancer patients share their personal experience, experience about receiving radiation therapy. You can also visit our RT Answers YouTube channel, which has other videos from our Ask a Radiation Oncologist series, as well as patient education videos that describe more about radiation therapy. Thank you all for tuning into the session. I also want to thank our panelists for their time and expertise. A reminder that you can subscribe to the RT Answers YouTube channel so you can be alerted about new videos we post to the channel. You can also follow us on Twitter at RT Answers underscore org, as well as Astro at Astro underscore org. Thank you.